Welcome to EET 3329C Communication System from Valencia College for the semester of the fall of 2020. I'm your lecturer, Dr. Wilfredo Riva Torres. First, we're going to start our first lecture. There will be two parts to it. Um, for our lecture number one, and it'll be an introduction to communication systems. Our, all our lectures are based on our textbook, which is Modern Digital and Analog Communication Systems from Latif and Ding. Our agenda for part one will be communication systems, a brief history. We'll talk about analog and digital messages, channel effects, and decibel or dB and decibel units. So for our brief history, um, you know, telecommunications has always been a vital part of human society. You know, in, even in ancient times, uh, we've always depended on communications for survival. So simple messages, simple methods were used by our ancestors. Things like messengers on foot or horseback. Notice that you have a message and a carrier. And would you believe it that we still do that today? There's a message, um, and a message. Uh, when I whenever we say message in the ter in terms of telecommunications, it also we also mean information. If I ever say information and message, they kind of mean the same thing as far as this course is concerned. And we will have a carrier, and we'll talk about what a carrier is, but it's an, ele an electrical carrier, right? Um, there's always been this need to convey either short messages over a long distance, and they, you know, again, our ancestors would use things like light, fire, smoke signals. Notice that the word signals is also a, a fairly an, ancient terms, right? And one that we still use for for wireless today. In fact, light, fire, and smoke, there's no wires, right? So that was, those kind of signals were the original wireless. As much as we talk about wireless today, this is just something that we as humans rediscovered. Um, other types of uh, communication were like, it's like signal mirrors. Now you can think about a signal mirror like the way the Greeks use it as something called a regenerative repeater. So what a regenerative repeater is after a certain distance, right? You need to take the signal, say in an electronic format, boost it back up because there's been certain loss in, in the power of your signal. So you need to boost it back up. Right, and then you send that on to the next leg. That's what a repeater does. Well, in the ancient times, they actually had this. Right, you can't uh, have a, a, a mirror go reflect light and trans and receive it at an infinite distance. Right, so after a certain distance, there was somebody there see what the message is, and then they would sort of take that message and use their mirror to either respond. Okay, I got the message, and then relay it to the next person, right? So think about this, like things like relays. Um, so you can also think about these reflectors as reflector or lenses like, that are the equivalent of amplifier and antennas, right? So a lens, if you ever use the lens with light and you see where it focuses light, right? That's like an amplifier. An amplifier takes a signal and sort of boosts it up. When you use the lens, what you actually is, you're, you're boosting up the, that ray of light, if you th kind of think about it, okay? Um, and some of these visual uh, technologies from our past, from the human past, are amazingly digital in nature. So as much as we talk about digital communications nowadays, again, it's not a new a new technology in the sense that we humans haven't done it before we have okay and in fact some of these f 
fires and and smoke kind of signals they're actually put together in a configuration that actually look like code words and that's what they are they are code words so so guess what right again and code words is a terminology that we will see as we progress to the course um so even optical systems, you you guys have heard of things like uh, fiber optics and that sort of thing on modern communications these days. Um, optical system again, it, it's a, it, the ancient times they had those. Those are just visual receivers, right? Again, the focusing of light and and the reflecting of light that that's an optical system, right? It's just that in those days uh, they needed direct line of sight. Right, and line of sight is exactly what it, what the term says. You're at point A and point B, and you can see them, right? There's nothing obstructing the view. There's a direct communication, nothing in between, no obstruction, okay? Um, but it always required human operators to decode whatever the, the, the code was, right? So guess what? Decoding is also a term that we had nothing but rediscovered. Um, some important events in history of telecommunication. Big one was when Mr. Hans Christian Orsted of uh, Denmark discovered that there's an interaction between electricity and magnetism. And then uh, Michael Faraday took it uh, beyond that and discovered that an electric current can induce a magnetic field, right? So, and he also uh, discovered the the, the other effect, right, the uh, complement effect of that, which is a magnetic field, can induce a current, right? So you can go both ways. This led to the transmission of electrical signals became possible by varying an electromagnetic field, which is what comes out of the antenna of your cell phone, right? And that's what makes it wireless or of your Wi-Fi um, uh, router at your house, that's what makes it wireless. The fact that it can transmit an electromagnetic wave, right? Um, and then this electromagnetic field can reach now a distant receiver somewhere and it doesn't have to be co-located. You don't even need line of sight anymore, okay? It's not a hard requirement. So far right discovery actually laid down the foundation for our wireless communication today, so you wouldn't have a cell phone had it not been for Mr. Faraday. Uh, there's some more um, for those of you with the textbook. Please look at Table 1.1 on your text. I do have it here, um, and I strongly recommend you read Section 1.7. They do uh, more justice to the history of telecommunications. Let me just point a few. Uh, 1830 to 32. This is uh, the birth of the telegraph. Um, we had the f first uh, detection of electromagnetic waves in 1887 by Mr. Henry Hertz. Yes, this is the guy for which the units of frequencies are named. That's why they call Hertz. Um, we have wireless telegraphy in somewhere in 1996. Uh, one of my favorite, the first commercial AM radios in the 1920s. Uh, the first cellular concept, with, which was proposed at Bell Labs in 1947, uh, Mr. Shannon, Claudie Shannon, one of my uh, uh, favorite persons in this whole field, he uh, was the first uh, major information theory paper, and we're actually going to talk about Shannon's law a little bit later. A um, few more things. Uh, first portable cellular phone, 1973 by Motorola. Uh, we had DSL modems uh, right at the birth of the internet uh, around 1989. Um, well, I shouldn't say the birth of the internet. The internet was already there. But this is kind of what began to really popularize it, I should say. Uh, the first digital, for those of you probably uh, people listening to this uh, or watching this video, um, the first DSM or digital cellular uh, type of uh, service was launched in finland in 1991 okay um, and then in 1999 uh, the first standard for what eventually is uh, came out of the ieee 
Institute of Electric and Electronic Engineers, the 802.11, and Wi-Fi was on its way, right? And where can you go today where you don't find Wi-Fi? So in less than 20 years, it's fairly you, ubiquitous. Anywhere you go, there's you expect to have Wi-Fi now, right? It's, 20 years ago, the, the, it was actually almost a novel concept, to be honest. Different types of communication scenarios, right? We can have like the first one, which is a wireline phone, not uh, not seen too much in most uh, large cities and, and, and uh, fairly developed countries, but there are still places in the world where they still use wireline phones and communicate to cell phones, right? That was one of the, the, the greatest things of uh, the cell phone. Now you can walk away, walk around anywhere with a phone and still be able to talk to your mom who was still using a wireline phone, right? Uh, we have other things like TV broadcasting systems. And yes, your computer, once it connects to a network, becomes a communication system, right? You have a message or information that you want to send somewhere, right? You're uploading a file, downloading a file, that's information, right? Now, we wouldn't study all these systems, right? That, that would be something totally inefficient. We wouldn't do that. So the goal of our course is to acquire basic knowledge needed to design, understand, and analyze communication systems in general. So this is a basic course. We're going to give you the basic general, and we're going to treat communications in general terms. There's different types of electronic communications, and it depends on what kind of things you can do with it, right? There's a one-way communication, and there's two-way communications, right? We could separate them in analog or digital signals, right? But those are the signals. Though. That's not the type of communication. That's the type of signals, right? The type of communication is either one-way or two-way. Many people confuse analog and digital with types of communication. They're not. They're, they're they're describing the signals. And we will talk about that some more. Now, types of communication, right? They're simple. The simplest, which is the simplest method, all right? That's probably where the name came from, simplex. And it's pretty much one way. So if you want to see a few examples, think about your radio AM or FM, your TV or broadcasting, right? And how about your pager? Hmm. Pagers were very interesting when they first came out because before that we knew broadcasting, right? AM and FM stations are a form of broadcasting, right? Broadcasting means uh, you have one transmitter where the information is originated and then you broadcast it to the wider audience and everybody gets it all at the same time and, and everybody who wants it, of course, right? Now, the pager was interesting because pagers actually are... Uh, not digital in the sense that we think about them today, but they were digital, right? Um, so a pager can do several things that broadcasts can't do. For, for one, a pager can go out in a broadcast way. So you can send a message and every pager in the region that it serves receives a page, right? Let's say it's an emergency system, right? Everybody gets a page. Nowadays, we use text for that, but it's the same concept. Now, however, a pager can also target a single person within the, its range, right? Or its coverage area, if you want to call it that. Or a pager can target a group of people. Let's say everybody in a hospital that, you know, there's an emergency, you want a, a certain nurses, you want certain doctors, some specialties like, uh, uh, respiratory therapists or whatever, and you just send it to that group of people, and they know the, the pager has information to them. Everybody needs to report to the emergency room. Okay. Now there's also full duplex. Full duplex is two way, right? And that's what most communication is. So whenever you can talk and listen, which is the same to say transmit and receive at the same time, then you have a full duplex system, which is what a telephone is or a cell phone, right? 
it might be rude for both people to try to talk at the same time, but it can still do that. And by the way, your, your phone can receive and transmit at the same time anyway, digital data, right? Um, so you can be sending a text and receiving a text at the same time, and the phone can do that, right? Now there's half duplex, right? Um, this form still two way, but it's only where one party can transmit at a time, not both. So you can't be rude on a half duplex system. Well, I guess you can still be rude, but not both at the same time. <laughs> so these are things like police, military, radio transmissions, or amateur amateur radio. So the biggest example here are things like walkie-talkies, if, if you think about it. Okay. So let's, what does a generalized, in general, what does a communication system look like? And that's what this picture here is from our textbook. Um, so you're always going to have an input message. Now, input message, and I use the term message a little loosely here, uh, only because it's kind of general. But message and information, from, for as far as this course is concerned, mean the same thing, right? So it's a thing that you want to get to the output, right, to the other side, right? So the purpose of your communication system is to make sure that your whatever your input message was is also your output message, right? No matter what happens in between, they're both the same, right? So you get the same information. Now, going back to our ancestors, right? You send somebody on a horse to deliver a message. Will the message be the same as it started out of? And that was kind of a problem back in those days, right? Um, which there was different ways of solving those problems <laughs> in the ancient times. One was changing the messenger, right? Um, so let's talk about a few things here. Oh, by the way, uh, I missed a point. So input goes to a transmitter through the channel, which is you somehow have to get it from point A to point B. That medium in between point A and point B is what we call the channel. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Then there'll be something that received the signal. We call that a receiver again going to go into more details and, and at the end something that goes back and takes that signal and produces the message now the thing about uh, the message when it's going to the channel right there's some challenges think about back in the day of a uh, messenger on a horse right the horse can get tired right the horse and or the messenger can get distracted take a take a wrong turn think about that as distortions or delays right uh, the message does change because you just forget exactly what they told you unless it's written, right? And then still it can get written and then if it get in the ancient times, if ink wasn't that good, you know, the message could get still distorted, okay? All right. So let's talk about a, a, a communication system. So the source, whatever the source is, TV brought... Uh, um, let's say a movie, uh, field news, uh, music, um, data of some sort. That's your input message or input information, right? Things like human voice, television pictures, email, right? If the message is non-electric, right? And this is the way we normally work, right? Human voice, email, text, right? You first have to convert it right and this is the to a suitable electrical waveform and this is the function of the input transducer so a microphone is a transducer it takes my voice and it converts it into electrical waveform and that becomes the input signal right? then you have a transmitter the function of the transmitter is to take the signal convert it into an appropriate form for transmission and transmission is the uh, the process of sending the signal through the channel. So the channel is the medium, it's a medium of your choice or the choice of the communication system, right? To convey the electrical signals from the transmitter output over a certain distance to the receiver, right? Now the receiver, its function is to actually reverse everything that the transmitter did. So it's gonna extract out of whatever it gets from uh, the channel Right, and remember the signal 
left the transmitter, went through the channel, got to the receiver. The receiver had to convert it back to a signal, right? To the information signal. Then it's the function of the output transducer to convert, convert that back to the original message, right? And again, the purpose of this whole thing is so that the input message equals the output message. And remember that the reason we do this is because we want to go certain distance with this information. So what is the challenge? Well, one of the biggest challenges, there's more challenges, but one of the biggest challenges is the channel itself. It's a physical medium, right? And it's not kind to your signal. It lets it through, but it, it's like charging a toll, right? So the first thing, it, it attenuates your signal. So if you start off with a signal, let's say one volt, and let's say after it travels a distance, as an example, you get one millivolt on the other side, right? You get one thousandth of whatever you sent out first. Um, it also distorts it. It might start off as a sine wave and then end up being, looking like something else when it gets there. Not right. So again, the channel is not very kind to you. Um, the attenuation does depend on the distance. It doesn't matter if you're going through a wire or through the air. Uh, the signal waveforms are further distorted by frequency dependent electronics, and even your channel can have frequency dependencies. Right. So let's say cable TV can't not transmit any signal at any frequency. There are certain frequencies where the cable will attenuate so much the signal that it doesn't go very far. Um, so signals passing through a communication channel uh, not only get distorted, they also are affected by noise, right? So, and noise is, comes from thermal motion of charged particles and conductors. Random emissions of fluorescent lights are known for that, carrying these random emissions and causing trouble with certain communications, etc. right? So the function, one of the functions as communication specialists is to find ways to mitigate the effects of internal noise. Remember, you will never fully eliminate this, right? There's always going to be some form of distortion and noise, right? Is how we limit these so that the information can still be effectively extracted out of it, out of it is is what the whole communication system is about now the whole thing about analog versus digital let's let's try to understand this why did we all of a sudden right to say oh digital is better and let's go digital right so message and communication systems can be either one we 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 know how to do analog communication and we know how to do digital Right in the beginning, any, everything was analog, in the telecommunication era in the early 20th century, right? Late 19, early 20s, when this whole thing started, everything was analog. Right then, along came people who said, you know, digital is better. For one, digital, you can only have m possibilities. We call them symbols, right? So we have these m array messages. What happens is the waveforms, right, that are the possibilities are limited. And you would say, well, it's a limited system then. Yes and no, right? Um, it's limited to an extent, but can we still get the information out of it? Remember, input message equal output message. That's all we care about. The reason MRE systems are so great is there's limited possibilities. So let's say there's only two possibilities, like a binary, right? Zero or one, right? You don't have to decide, was it 0.9 or was it 0.95 or any other number between zero and one? All you have to decide is, is it a zero? Is it a one, right? You don't have to decide anything else. And if it's a zero or one, Okay, you decide that one, then along comes the next decision, is it a zero or a one? And then you start building the original message back up, right? That's a lot easier than an infinite number of possibilities between zero and one, okay? So, and, and that's really what all this binary thing is about because you end up with what's known as a finite size alphabet. 
right? You don't have to, again, analog. The thing about analog, you can go from zero to infinity. With digital, is zero up to the impossible symbols. And, and think about it as an integer steps, right? None of this thing with decimals, let's say, okay? Which makes our life a lot easier. Here's kind of what it looks like, right? So let's say we have the binary case, right? So looking at this graph, uh, 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 this figure from our textbook, let's say that we start off with something that's digital in nature. You start off with a wave from that's either minus A or plus A, right? Um, once you go to transmit it, and let's say you get a, a, the receiver, if you had a perfect ideal system, you would get B because the, at the very least the channel is frequency selective, so it gets rid of those sharp corners, right? You can kind of still see the, the original digital signal, can you, right? It's kind of easy to know because all you have to do is look at the line in the middle. If it's, when I look at it, if it's above the line, I say it's a one. If it's below the line, I say it's a zero. And that's the end of statement. That's how digital works. Now look at C. C actually includes other structures that we saw before from, let's say, frequency selection alone, but now it has noise. Still, the job between deciding if it's a zero or one isn't doesn't seem that complicated in this simple picture, right? Now, if you look at D, D looks at pretty much the same as A, the D trace here. Um, the only difference between a and D is a delay, right? So the message is received sometime later, which has always happened. Again, going back to the example of the message on horseback, it takes him a certain time from the time he left the transmitter to the time he arrives at the receiver. It takes time. This is all goes back to the principles of causality. If you ever heard of cause and effect, right? So you, the cause is there's a message. The effect is the message is going to get there when it gets there, right? So it's going to take time. I don't care what your system is. I don't care how short your channel is. It does take time, right? So whenever you're transmitting a message, it always takes time to get there. Cause and effect. All right. So how do we get from analog to digital? So we just, we need some some kind of conversion. And this is what this A, A to D, uh, I'm going to call it, right? A slash D, we normally pronounce that A to D. And it stands for analog to digital converter. This is what enables digital communications to convey analog signals, so, okay? But such as audio and video. Right, so analog signals are continuous in time. That means they're, they always exist, right? And they have any value, again, between zero and infinity, and uh, actually between minus infinity and plus infinity, any, and anything in between. Now, digital signals, I already said, only exist at discrete levels, but the other thing interesting about digital signals is they only exist at certain discrete time points. They don't exist always, right? So you get what is known as a sample, right? And we're going to look at this process in a second. So you look at a continuous time signal, but you have to sample it first. And a sample is exactly what it means. You don't take the whole thing. You take a sample, right? So you take a small piece of it, if you will. And then here's the magic of digital is you quantize it. This is where you fix the levels. So see, you fix it in time and you fix it in level. That is what digital does for us. It makes everything fixed. It happens at a certain, we know when it's going to happen. We know when we're going to get the digital information and we know it has to be a small selective level, right? The finite number of levels. So let's see how this analog to digital thing conversion works, right? Uh, what is the A to D? And we're going to talk some more about this in channel five and more about the sampling theorem and other things. But in general, how, how does it work, right? And, and uh, let me point just one level here, right? So let's say I'm looking at 11.7. This is where this arrow is pointing to, right? Hope, 
where I'm showing my marker where this arrow is, right? I don't care about 11.7, okay? I, I, I honestly, uh, actually, that's not 11.7, sorry. Uh, I apologize. Uh, this is 11.7. I don't care about 11.7. I actually don't care about the point where the arrow is pointing at either. I either care, do I call that an 8 or a 9, right, from where the arrow is pointing. And in fact, I don't even care where the arrow is pointing. I only care at the finite time where I'm going to sample it. Excuse me. So let's say um, I decide to sample at this point. Right, and at that point, all I want to care is it's an eight or a nine, right? So it's really where you see the dots, these black dots. That's all I really care about. That is my sample signal, right? That's the incident time. And remember, I have to put it in one of those levels. So right now, I'm going to split my signal between zero and fifteen. So I have sixteen levels. That's all I care about, right? I'm going to quantize my signal between zero and fifteen. And then what we do with zero to fifteen? we assign a binary equivalent, okay? How many binary digits? I'm gonna show you guys soon. But this is really what quantization does. We select, we sample at, at certain regular intervals, and when we sample, we quantize it. <coughs> then we convert it to digital. Okay, so once the A to D conversion is done, the original message it's a, a sequence of samples, right? And we have to represent it in our, let's call it L quantization levels, right? Um, now, we don't really transmit the quantization levels, right? We convert that to binary. And that process is needs a code. And, and this whole process is what we call post-coded modulation. It's a very simple, common, and powerful methodology, and it's what we use. For first, one information bit, right? It refers to a binary digit, either one or zero, right? So we're gonna convert everything to bits, and everything is gonna end up being a one or a zero, or combinations of ones and zeros. Um, so essentially, we, we're gonna have two waveforms that we, we are gonna worry about something that we're gonna call P1 of T, which we're gonna represent the one, and P0 of T, which is gonna represent the zero, right? That, that's really what it is. And they're gonna be constant with, from, from sample uh, interval to the next sample interval. They're gonna stay constant, which is another nice thing about it, okay? So going back to our 15 levels, we have the binary equivalent, and then the postcode waveform, the PCM modulated waveform, will look something like on this table again from our textbook. So look at, for example, the 000. It's going to look like a series of pulses at whatever P0 is, and we're showing it as a negative or below, below the line, if you will. Notice, for example, 0001, the one, we have to use the waveform for the one. The other threes are zero, which is below the line, but then the one is above the line. Right, and that line is sort of that middle point, which is our threshold between zero and a one. Now, how many bits would we require uh, for 16 levels, right? So there's a simple formula. It says that the number of bits equals log two, okay, log two of, of L, okay, log two of L. That's uh, what um, how we calculate the number of bits needed. So if I have 16 levels, if you do log base two, this is the logarithm base two, right? There's a formula at the bottom right corner of this um, slide. If you want to do everything, uh, if all your calculators and most calculators only do log 10 or the natural logarithm, but if you do log 10, what you do is you take log 10 of the number and you divide it by log 10 of 2, right? Um, and then you get how many bits you need. So log 2 of 16 actually ends up being 4. So you need 4 bits for to represent all 16 levels, right? And when I say you need 16 quantized values, 
16 unique binary quantized levels. Okay? That's what uh, you will need four bits to represent all 16 unique quantized levels. Okay, so we will frequently uh, be talking about communication circuits, different circuits. Uh, a, a concept that comes along uh, fairly commonly in communications is concept of gain, right? And um, so gain is is um, is a topic that we need to talk about some more. So in communication circuits and actually the circuits in general, what we're doing is we're map manipulating signals to produce a desired result. So in circuit gain is an expected, an important aspect of this manipulation. So gain is nothing but the ratio of some output to the input of whatever the circuit it is. And it depends, it could be voltage, it could be current, or it can be power, right? So we say that amplification occurs when the output is greater than the input. So this G defined by output divided by input would be greater than one. Okay, so it would be greater than one. Okay, um, if we want to see, uh, if we talk about attenuation, that occurs when the output is less than one. Okay, so we're talking about the output being less than one. Okay. Uh, most passive devices, that devices that are not, that they don't have, or we call them passive, is because they have gain less than one. And a very, uh, uh, or sometimes uh, we, we actually just know these are referred to these as attenuators, okay? So the whole concept of attenuator, of an attenuator. All right, there's different gain types that we can talk about. For example, we could talk about voltage gain, which is defined as, and we'll use the, the letter G sub V, equal to V out over Vn to talk about voltage gain. Uh, most amplifiers also have, are also power amplifiers. So same procedure for power gain, we, we'll call it G sub P, which equals output divided by the input. So these ratios, gain voltage or gain power, it, 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 it are, are defined as we see here, right? And notice that P in, I usually use that variable to represent the input power and P out is the output power. One can also talk about the power gain of an attenuator. It's just that for an attenuator, the power gain is less than one. Okay, the power gain for an attenuator is less than one. All right. Now cascade again, normally an amplifier or an attenuator doesn't exist all by itself. In order to manipulate the signal, you usually connect these in cascade. Now a cascade is when you have two uh, circuits, two devices, and th the first device has an input and an output. The output of the first device or stage, let's say it's an amplifier, we'll call that a stage, is the input to the second stage, which could be an attenuator or another amplifier or something else, right? So we're gonna connect all these things together. When you connect them together, you end up having a cascade uh, system, or you can call it a cascaded circuit, or some people will just call it a circle, a circuit in general, right? But the total gain ends up being the product, okay? The product of all the individual gains. Okay, so we're talking about the gain total. So um, you just multiply the gain of the n stages, how many n referring to the total number of stages, okay? You just multiply that to get the total gain. All right, here's an example. So I have three amplifiers. Notice that all the gains, gain, power gains, GP1, GP2, GP3, 12, 10, and five respectively. If I ask you what is the total output gain, you just multiply the three. Okay, so we're going to just go ahead and, um, and multiply all three gains. Okay, that's what this equation is doing. And you end up with a result 12 times 10 times 5 equal a gain of 600. And like every, and, and hopefully you remember that gain expressed in this way has no units. Okay, uh, furthermore, if I ask you what is 
if the input power is 10 milliwatts, so I'll tell you how much the input power is, what is the output power? Well, look at the definition for gain. Okay, power gain is P out over Pn. What do you know? What do we know here? We know here the, the gain, total gain, and we know the input power. So what we need to do is figure out what, how much is the output power, right? So simple manipulation of this gives us this equation down here that P out equals G gain power times input power. So 600 times 10 milliwatt is 10 times 10 to the minus three. And if you do your uh, multiplications, you would actually get 6,000 times 10 to the minus three. Uh, I didn't specify what output units I was looking for in this problem. So you could have, a, a proper answer would have been 6,000 milliwatts, or I convert it from milliwatts to watts and it comes out to six watts. Um, here's a different example. Now I, I replaced a second amplifier by an attenuator here. Um, and I changed the gain values around a little bit. So 12.1 because it's an attenuator, so I have to be gain less than one. And um, so that's right here. Right? Okay, that's right here. Um, and then you have or right here. Okay. And then you have a, a, a gain for stage three of 30. Um, remember, you, we're going to multiply the 3, 12 times 0.1 times 30, 36. Slightly different input power this time, 100 milliwatts. What is the output power? Uh, if you do your uh, calculations, it comes up to 3.6 watts. Or equivalent, it will be 3,600 milliwatts. All right. Uh, we will operate most of the time in this unit called a decibel. Now, a decibel in electrical engineering is defined as 10 times the base 10 logarithm, base 10 logarithm, okay, of a ratio between two levels. Now, isn't it convenient that gain, any gain that we talked about, is already a ratio, right? It's unitless, right? So we're going to define this gain in dB as 10 log of the gain, of the power gain, okay? Which ends up being 10 log of P out, right? So you hear P out over Pn, right? And remember, this is log base 10, right? I didn't put the 10 on my equation, but it is log 10. And I mentioned that because there's different logarithms, right? There's a natural logarithm, which is, uses the base E or the uh, natural uh, E, natural logarithm is uh, some number E that's 2.71 uh, in value. Uh, that's not the log. Be careful on your calculators, right? Normally, if it says log on your calculator, it's log base 10, and natural logarithms, they do LN. However, MATLAB or Octave, which we will use extensively in this course, um, Actually, you if you use log, it's a natural logarithm. You have to use log 10. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, all gains greater than 1 end up being expressed in decibels as greater than 0. So if your gain is greater than 1, you'll have decibels that are greater than 0. Any gain less than 1, which will be an attenuation or a loss, would be a negative number or less than 0. Okay, know that for most cases, we encounter the numerical ratio gain is a positive number. It's, it's weird if I say gain of, of minus 10 dB, because normally that's an attenuation of minus 10 dB, right? So just be careful. Sometimes I'll say attenuation of 10 dB, you already know that that means minus 10 dB. So we will... Uh, uh, be consistent whenever we talk gain and we want to talk attenuation or loss. One is positive, right, for gain, and attenuation and loss are negative in terms of dB. Um, whenever you take, dBs can take any value from minus infinity to plus infinity, but this is one of the advantages of working in dBs. It makes either really big numbers or really small numbers, like something in phantom amps or phantom peak. Now, phantom farads, really small numbers, right? 
or let's say it takes something like 9.85 times 10 to the 19, it makes it a much smaller manageable number when you express it in dBs, okay? Um, it can, you can't have zero dBs. Zero dBs means a gain of one. Why is that? Because log of one, right? log base 10 of one equals, okay? That equals zero, okay? Log of one, okay? Remember, uh, log, I'm going to put it base 10. Let me put the 10 here of 1 equals 0. Okay? Always remember that. <laughs> That's why uh, 1 equals 0 dB. Um, we can express uh, decibels for voltage gain and current gain or attenuation, power gain or attenuation, and here are the basic formulas. Uh, now, power gain, how come power gain uh, uses 10 and voltage gain uses 20? Okay, because if you remember, power is voltage squared over R. Notice how down here, right, what we're doing is we're replacing power by V square over R, V out square over R, V in square over R. The two R's are equal, so they cancel out. You end up with V out square over V in square. You can take the exponent because they both have the same exponent out of the parentheses. And then when you do a logarithm of something to the power, it's like multiplying by this power. So I take the two and I multiply it by the 10 and that's where this 20 comes from, okay? Uh, quick hint, I did mention this briefly. If you're gonna use MATLAB or Octa for that matter, log has to be log 10. That's the right function to use. <clears throat> if you lose log, that'll be the natural logarithm and that's not what we want when we calculate dB. All right, one of the big advantages of, D, uh, of working everything in dB is we can express gain and attenuation when they're both converted to dB, everything becomes an addition. So remember when we we're doing the total gain, we had to multiply. It's the same, it's saying that multiplications in linear terms, that's non dB. So whenever I say gain in linear terms, that means not in dB. So that multiplication becomes an addition in dBs. That's what this formula here is showing us, okay? And again, up to n stages. Uh, same thing, and we calculated the total gain of the linear quantities. So here's an example. Let's say we have an amplifier of, you know, 1,666.67, and it's followed by a filter that has a law of 0 0.04. What is the cascaded overall gain? All right, and I want to express it in dB. So um, you'll see my formula for, for uh, gain total in dB as gain one plus gain two, both of them in dB. So I calculate them both here, gain one and gain two. Notice the 10 log. Uh, and how come I use 10 log? Because I said that these were power gains, okay? Um, you do the calculations, right? Log of the 1,600, and so it comes out to 3.222 and log of uh, 0 0.04 log base 10 minus about one minus 1. 1.4 you multiply by 10 you do a little bit of rounding and you end up with 32.2 and minus 14 and then you just add them for a total answer of 18.2 okay notice that if the figure in decibel is positive that the the not denotes sorry again and negative denotes loss or attenuation right so if it's negative it's either a loss or attenuation now so far everything was a ratio when you do a ratio it ends up unitless but what if I want to express power in units of DB right 
If you remember when I asked you to do the examples to do the output power, that was a multiplication. So if my power were also in some kind of dB units, I can just add them, right? Gain in dB plus power in dB units, I just add them up and I get the output power in dB units, okay? So power can actually be expressed in decibel scale. Uh, you, we can reference it to two most popular is either milliwatts or watts, right? So reference to one milliwatt or one watt. Notice that dB units is always a ratio, even when we talk about power. So whenever I talk about a unit of dBm, that is a decibel base unit of power, and it's referenced to one milliwatt. So you take your power, you divide it by one milliwatt, 10 log of that, and that becomes dBm, right? Uh, and it turns out that one milliwatt, right, because it, everything is referenced to one milliwatt, if I take one milliwatt and I divide it by my reference, which is also one milliwatt, I get one. We already know that log of one is zero. We already said that. So one milliwatt equals zero dBm. That's your reference. Similarly with the power units of dB watts. It's just that there everything is referenced to one watt. All right, so here's your two basic formulas. So what if I want to convert between dB watts and dBm, right? So I have my definition here for both dBm and dB watts. So now recall that one watt equals 1,000 milliwatts. So I, if I say PD and dB watts equals 10 log of power divided by one watt, right? I'm going to take this watt. I'm going to say that's 1,000 times one milliwatt which is 1,000 milliwatts, right? Um, I'm going to keep this as one number and the 1,000 as an, um, an, another. So actually what's in parentheses, I end up expressing it as 1 over 1,000 times P over 1 milliwatt, okay? Think about that. Then I'm going to use this uh, uh, rule or... or uh, about logs, if I divide A by B, I, that ends up being log of A minus log of B. So I end up keeping the P over one watt, right? And if I divide that by a thousand, that, that ends up in being in this log minus 10 log of a thousand. That's where this number comes from. And log 10, again, log 10 of a thousand ends up being three times 10. That's where this 30 comes from. So if I want to convert between power and dB watts or and dBm, I just subtract 30 from, from it. And that converts it back to power and dB watts. And you can see how if I have it in, in dB watts and I want to convert it to dBm, I just add 30 to it. This is, again, one of those things about working in dBs that's really nice and convenient. It's easy to convert between units, especially in terms of power. Here's another example. Let's say I have an input power of 10 dBm. The, uh, the gains have specified what is the output power in dBm, right? Notice that because all the powers here are in dBs, right? These are all units of dBs, right? dBs and dBs. For gain total, all I have to do is add them up, okay? Uh, so I end up adding 12 minus, plus which is minus 10 because this is an attenuator, and 20. I end up with a total gain of 22 dB. P out in terms of uh, dB is GT plus gain total plus PN, which is 10 plus 22, and you end up with a result, right, uh, of 32 dBm. So this circuit, if I put 10 dB in, in I get 32 dBm out. Okay, simple math. Most of this stuff you can almost do without having to write it down. Okay, here are the rules for working with dBs or decibels. Follow these rules, you'll never get yourself in trouble. Don't follow these rules and you will end up with a lot of trouble, which, is, which means wrong results. First, always be aware, are you working in power ratios? Okay, is it power ratios or amplitude Right, amplitude, voltage currents, 
uh, ratios. You need to apply the correct factor, either the 10 for power ratio or the 20 for voltage ratio, voltage or current ratio. Rule number two, never mix ratios and decibels algebraically. They don't mix well, okay? Work either with one or the other, either work in ratios, linear quantities, or work in dB, never mix them in an equation, avoid yourself some trouble, right? Make sure everything is in dBs or in dBms or dB watts before you start working. Never multiply decibels, they only add, they only, only, only add or subtract, okay? Never mix dBn and dB watts, right? You have to convert to one or the other and work in that unit, okay? Again, they don't mix well. Um, sometimes you actually have to go from dB back to linear quantities. Um, some books will say log to the minus one. I do not like that notation because some people end up believing that it's one over the log. So I normally talk in terms of anti-log, right? Which in your calculator, it's you have either a second or an inverse button, and then you hit the log, that's the anti-log. Or some calculators actually force you to do 10 to the X, which in our case, you have to take whatever your gain is you have to divide it by 10, right? Which is the same as 10 to the gain divided by 10. It's what this the term is looking at. For voltage ratios or ratios in general, just remember that instead of dividing by 10, you divide by 20, okay? This is the MATLAB format that I'd like you guys to use. It's 10, the caret means the exponential, like in this case, right? And then you divide the gain power to say by 10, all right? Um, if you wanna go from dBm to watts, here's a simple formula, et cetera, okay? And you guys kind of get the idea of, of how that works. Here's some useful, some useful values, right? So zero dBm, we know that in power ratio is one. Uh, three and minus three are two and 0.5 approximately. Uh, minus six and plus six, four and 25, and 10 dB is actually 10, and minus 10 is 0.1. Where did this come handy? See, you can almost do this. If I tell you that uh, you have a gain of, of, in terms of power equal to 20, right? And I want you to express that in dB. Well, you know that 20, okay? 20 equals two, times 10, nothing to write home about. But if I convert it to dBs first, I can actually add those, right? So I'm asking you to put it in dB. So gain P and dB, right? You can do the 10 log of two plus 10 log of 10, or if you remember this table, you know that two is three dB, so there's three plus 10, right? This 10 over here is 10 dB. I'm sorry about that line. My 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 tablet seems to be. I did that again. I need to write a little bit bigger. Sorry. Um, so let's say gain power and dB equals three plus ten, which equals thirteen dB. You could do this as ten log 10 of 20. And if you do it, you're gonna get the same result, which is 13 dB, okay? All right, in this course, we will uh, make extensive use of MATLAB and Octave. So let's say um, I asked you to create a similar table to the one before using MATLAB or Octave. All right, so the first thing is, uh, let's create uh, on line number two here. Okay, let's go to line number two, which is right here. And let's create an array with the values that we wanna put in our table. Let's say it's 0 0.1, 0 0.25, which is one fourth. 0 0.5, here is one through five in steps of one, and then 10. 
here is where I'm going to do the 10 log of the game power, which is GP, which is right here, right? Line number two. Okay. Um, and then this line, line number five, what I'm doing there is I'm just creating an array with two columns. My table is going to have two columns, right? So I put GP, I uh, put a semicolon uh, in between them and I call GPDB. That creates a mess column, two column vectors, right, in my array, right? So I have two columns of data. Now, this F print F thing, it, what it's doing is it's just going to allow me to write to the command window where's my active output, right? So F print F, um, I'm going to format my line. I can first put uh, a title that's GP. This slash T puts a tab and then GP and DB. And then the slash N means go to the next line. The next line I like to, I, which is line eight here, I like to put some separator from my table. Uh, and then I'm going to do a nine nine is where I'm going to format the data. How do I want to visualize it? So I'm going to, this F here, you need the percentage sign, right? But the percentage F means floating, so it has a decimal point. And you guys can go and look at the F print uh, uh, documentation to understand more about it if you haven't seen it before. The 3.2 means I want as much as three integer, right? Or to the right point, I want as much as three possible places. And then after the, the decimal point, I want as not just two. That's why you see 0 0.10, 0 0.25, and, and the like. Uh, the same thing for GP data, same format, and then a new line. Okay. And at the end, I just write one more new line so I can separate them. Now, when I run this, this is kind of, uh, you're going to see, right? You hit the run in, inside of uh, MATLAB or um, Octave, and you get some display that looks like this table inside of Octave. As a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and uh, fire up Octave and see what it looks like, OK? All right, for those of you in, in the course, if you install Octave, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, I cleared everything so that you can kind of see what it looks like uh, when you first come in. Um, I like to go always to a folder. I like to put all my .m files, or at least the ones that I'm going to use in the session, in the same folder. I put it under this comms folder for this class. Um, and here's chapter one, example one, the one that we were just looking at. right? So here's kind of a, a look at what's available in this folder. Um, we'll look at the workspace, and it does give you a command history. Um, Here's the command window. Notice at the bottom of the command window, which is what comes up by default, you have a series of tabs. So this is command window. Here's where you can type in different commands and, and, and et cetera for Octave. Very similar to MATLAB for those of you that uh, like to use MATLAB. There is a documentation uh, um, tab down at the bottom. And the one that I spent most of my time is with editor. So how did I bring this up? You can either double click on it here or go file open, right? So this is the exact same uh, uh, code that we were looking at, right? So if you run this, notice there's no workspace variables. I uh, cleared them before I started here. So if I go ahead and tell it to run, right? One of the nicest things about Octave, it's, it will save and then run the file. So you always have the latest saved. So let's go ahead and run that. Notice that now you have the different variables. There's GP, GP and DB, and GP data, which are the three variables that we created here. Okay, and then here are F print commands that should create the table, and you will see the table in the command window. So let's switch to the command window, right? So if you're in this class, all you have to do is do a screenshot of this, put it in your homework report, and you're done. Now, um, for those of you who like to create fancy GUIs and tables, and you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I'm, I would be perfectly happy in this course with this. This is this is enough for me. Okay, uh, I don't really need you guys to do anything more sophisticated than what you see here. And then again, if you don't, if you're not familiar with fprintf, please go ahead and make yourself familiar with it. Again, anything 
uh, any other kind of display from Octave, you, again, you're more than welcome to use it, Octave or MATLAB. Uh, but this is uh, like, um, but I would accept this, okay? Okay, moving right along. So here's another example. So I want you now to create a table of PN versus P out for the cascade of components that you see here. Uh, I want PN to vary from 100 milliwatts, okay? That's right here, from 100 milliwatts to 1,000 milliwatts. And in steps of uh, 50, oh, I forgot to put the units here, uh, 50 milliwatts, okay? Using Octave or MATLAB. Uh, and then I want you to express P out both in watts and in dBm, okay? Um, here's the code for it. Notice that I create uh, one array that holds all my gains. That's line number two. I create another array for all my powers. Notice 100 to 1,000 and steps of 50. Okay, that's the right notation for that. Um, because everything I said is milliwatts, then I multiply by 1 e to the minus 3. Right? And if I multiply by e to the minus 3, that converts it to watts. Okay? I want to work in watts. Remember what the problem said. Uh, it wants it either in watts or in dBm. Okay? All right. So uh, what's the next thing that we do? In line 5, we do 10 log of GP. So the three gains, we convert it to dB. Now, you don't have to do it this way. You can multiply the three if you want. Right, and then multiply everything by watts, and at the end, convert everything to dB. I prefer to convert to dB and then sum. See, because I convert in lines five to dB, then in line six, I can use the function called sum, right? Called sum. And uh, by using sum, I can just sum a GP and dB, and it adds all the elements of that array. Uh, on line number eight, I calculate PN and dBm, which is 10 log of power and watts plus 30. I gave you guys that formula earlier. And line 10 is where I calculate P out and dBm, which is adding power and dB, the total power, plus PN and dB. I, again, I also gave you that formula earlier. And then I can just convert everything to watts, the output power to watts, which is on line 12. And then again, on line 14, I organize my data in columns. So PN is the first column in watts. P out in watts is the second one. And the third one is P out in dBm. Remember, if you put a title line and a separator on your table, it makes it easy for whoever's reading it to know what's going on. Uh, uh, and then format the line and pretty much when you hit the run button, right? You hit the run button in MATLAB or Octave, you get this table. And that'll be it for today. And our next class, we will talk about the series of topics here, noise, signal-to-noise ratio, channel capacity, transmission, channel losses, modulation and detection, and then some digital source coding and error correction coding basics. See you in part two of the lecture.